Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Cup, brought to you by Cup of Hemlock Theatre. Today, I'm joined by another very special guest. Some of you, fans of the show, might recognize her from our King John Stratford on Film Review. She is a multi-talented director, playwright, dramaturg, actor, producer, and she is currently the Assistant Artistic Director of Sweet Tea Shakespeare. Claire Martin, thank you for joining us. Hey, Ryan, thank you so much for having me. No problem. So, as always, we're going to start with our favorite question, what's in your cup today? Very, very strong coffee. It is 10 a.m. on the West Coast, which is where I am, mm -hmm. and uh, I had a, had a late one last night, so I'm trying to wake up. That's perfectly fine. Hopefully this stimulating discussion will get you, plus the coffee, just get you right up on your feet. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> so that's... You? I have orange pico tea, which is kind of my usual go-to on a lot of these. Um, also, you are the assistant artistic director of Sweet Tea Shakespeare, which I, I don't think we have sweet tea here in the sense that you do, but I thought tea was appropriate, so. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I really appreciate the solidarity. Yes, of course. So before we kind of talk about Sweet Tea and something else that we are definitely going to talk about is this adaptation of War and Peace that you wrote, which we will trust me, we will get into that. First, I want to just kind of hear a little bit about you. Maybe just tell us a little about yourself, how you got into theater, your career thus far. The floor is yours to describe that however you please. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you for the floor. I don't, I don't know how much of it I want to cover uh, with my dancing. Um, cause I'm afraid that if I, I'm afraid that if I, if I start mamboing, we may, we may never get to War and Peace, but, um, Good point. <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, as you sort of so graciously said in your introduction, um, I'm a multidisciplinary theater artist. Um, and that is, that is really how I enter the work. Um, mm -hmm. the only thing that I, that I sort of don't do or have any experience with is design. But other than that, I have worn many hats. Um, and, uh, I, I'm a trained director. Um, but I also love dramaturgy. I've trained as a classical actor, um, and I am a playwright. Um, and so for me, uh, storytelling just kind of in the theatrical format is the most exciting uh, thing that I can do in the world. I just love it with all my heart, and I, I truly believe that it, can, um, uh, that it can incite positive change, uh, that it can help bring people together, that it can give us hope for the future, that it can help us turn a critical eye on our society. Um, and so basically since the age of 10, I've just kind of been like, I'm going to do theater and I don't know what exactly, but I'm just going to, I just want to be in those rooms where the stories are, where the stories with, with bodies and heartbeats are being told. Um, mm -hmm. I did my, I did my master's in theater directing at the Royal Holloway, um, University of London, uh, where I trained under Katie Mitchell, um, one of the preeminent directors kind of working in the world today, certainly the preeminent female director working in, uh, the UK and Europe. Um, and that was a really formative experience for me. I got to spend a year in London. I got to observe her rehearsals, and then I got to be her assistant director on a show that she sent to New York City, um, where I worked with Ben Whishaw, one of the most extraordinary actors. Um, and um, that was, like, that was sort of the end of my tr uh, education trajectory. And since then, I've just been bopping around the US um, trying to do trying to do classical theater, which is my great love. Um, I do I have this profound passion for Shakespeare, but actually I specialize in restoration comedy and restoration drama. So anything from like 1660 to 1720 right in there, that is like my sweet spot. Um, and so in fact, we just yesterday we started rehearsals for a, um, a completely virtual uh, radio drama production of William Congreve's The Way of the World. Cool. I'm profoundly excited about and uh, just like giddy with excitement to go to rehearsal tonight. Um, so yeah, restoration is kind of my, kind of my baby. Um, but anything that's heightened text um, tends to be, tends to be where I'm at. And yeah, and now I, now I work for Sweet Tea Shakespeare, uh, where I'm directing and also kind of doing the administrative side and I'm also producing a podcast for them. So mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. Well, all sorts that's all wonderful. And it actually occurs to me while you're saying this, that you're actually the first non-Canadian guest we've had on the show. So we are branching out. <laughs> Welcome. I'm, yeah. I don't know if I'm a, I don't know if I'm a good representation I of America, but worry. I'm honored to be the first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not concerned. <laughs> so Sweet Tea Shakespeare, that is yeah. exciting that you've recently been appointed to that. Now I understand that you were just given this position right before 
everything closed down and you haven't even moved to North Carolina yet, you're still, like you said, on the West Coast. So uh, for the benefit of our most predominantly Canadian audience, uh, what can you tell us about the company Sweet Tea Shakespeare? What do you do, et cetera, et cetera? <laughs> So Sweet Tea Shakespeare is a, um, a small nonprofit classical company um, based in a small town in North Carolina, but they're actually looking to expand and create kind of a simultaneous branch in the, the metropolis of Raleigh that's nearby. And I was hired to sort of head that up. So uh, when it is safe for me to travel and I travel to North Carolina, I will actually be based in a city uh, and I will be sort of directing a series of shows that will be running concurrently to the shows that are running in, in Fayetteville. Um, uh, Sweet Tea has, I mean, Sweet Tea produces like between three and seven full productions a year in addition to doing um, concerts. We have a Drunk Shakespeare series. Uh, we do, um, you know, we do benefits. We do fundraisers every winter. There's like a um, sort of a Christmas themed show. Um, Sweet Tea is really invested in the, the magic and the delight uh, of just live Shakespeare performance. And so, um, the, the company really strives to, to get in tune with the text and not to really worry too much about, um, about the spectacle, the fourth wall, the realism that many sort of higher budget regional theaters strive to emulate on their stages. <laughs> so um, it's, it's often performed outdoors in the parks. Um, it's often very kind of like whimsical, surrealistic staging. For instance, during the storm scene in The Last King Lear they did, they had the actresses playing Goneril and Regan just pour cups of water on Lear's head. So it's all, it's, um, it's all about sort of getting in touch with the, the magic of the language uh, and not worrying too much about, about realism and, uh, and allowing the ensemble of actors, the company of actors, to really come together and tell the story as one body. Um, and so, uh, as you said, I was hired, um, I was hired in January, but I, I was meant to start working in, in mid-March because I was actually doing a show in Portland. I was doing a show in Portland at the time. Yes, mid-March. Um, uh, the, those, those like, those like March 13th, 14th, 15th, the days that will live in infamy in my mind, but, um. In most people's minds, trust me. Oh, man. <laughs> um, but also, but also for me, like, there's this profound, uh, I I love for that time too, because it's when I started working on War and Peace. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was meant to, I was meant to start working in, in mid-March. Obviously, um, I couldn't move to North Carolina as planned because the world shut down, Oregon shut down. Um, and, uh, to my sort of everlasting gratitude and amazement, Sweet Tea um, decided to keep me on, even though they were mm -hmm. making a huge investment in hiring me. Um, they sort of sent me all of this wonderful podcasting recording equipment, and they were like, we've been wanting to start a podcast anyway. Now seems like the right time. <laughs> it's something that you can do from Portland, Oregon. So welcome to the team. You're going to work for us virtually. And I was like, okay. So ever since whatever, mid-March, I guess four months now, um, I've been working for the company remotely. Um, and I've been, I've been heading up our podcast, which has many different strains. We did an Enneagram series where we typed all of the Shakespeare characters on the nine point Enneagram. Uh, I, I interview artists from all over the country and really all over the world, um, about their craft. We have a cocktail hour where we get together and drink alcohol and just talk about things in theater, uh, that are sort of of the present moment. Like we did a Hamilton episode when, uh, when that movie dropped. Uh, and then I'm also directing and leading. Um, full cast readings of some classical plays and full like full cast radio dramas where we actually rehearse a play for a couple of weeks, record it, send it to our editors um, who write or orchestral music and add like a soundscape of sound design. Um, and we release those as well. So um, I have been amazingly keeping busy, even though everything I do is at my computer. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, I have, I have yet to see the place where I'm going to be. Well, hopefully soon hopefully we'll see how things go <laughs> but yeah you actually kind of already answered my next question in that which is what has the company been doing to stay active during quarantine so nice to hear there's all those projects is there anyone you left out that you think you might want to touch on or no it's okay if there's not i will say i mean i will say i've been just like dazzled and honored to have made friends with the, the Cup of Hemlock crew. Yeah. Almost sheer happenstance. Like I did a, um, on behalf of Sweet Tea Shakespeare, I volunteered for a Shakespeare drinking game that Tori Urquhart was sort of organizing. Um, and that was where I met Will. Mm -hmm. He was also on that panel that week. And then he just reached out to me afterwards 
when we were both tipsy or whatever, and he was like, hey, like. That's usually where the doing, best conversations happen. <laughs> we're, doing, we're doing a series where we watch the, the Stratford Festival's sort of filmed productions, and then we talk about them. Like, would you like to join one or, you know, one or two of our panels? And I was like, absolutely. Um, and so that was how I met you, was working on the King John yeah. panel. That's how I met Matt. Um, and now you've so graciously invited me into your, you know, sort of your squad. And so I get to, I get to collaborate with your company and I get to make friends with you as artists, um, through Zoom, like through these sort of online platforms. Um, and so in addition to Sweetie's work, that's been the great joy for me has just been connecting with artists that I wouldn't otherwise meet because everyone is working online. There's this democratization of communication that's happened in theater. Um, and so even though these are these are dark times and I miss being in a room with actors more than I can possibly express. Um, I also, I still feel nourished, right? I still feel like um, there is art happening in my life that, I, that I'm having, that I have an active part in making. Um, and so that's been really, really humbling. Yeah, that's great. Speaking of collaborations between Cup of Havelock and Sweet Tea or your work in particular, uh, we have something that I think this is probably the first time we're announcing it, perhaps, unless Will said something on the Antony and Cleopatra episode that I haven't seen yet. Um, but yeah, we are working on a possible like tiny little collaboration. If you want to talk about that, I think we are authorized to do so. Fantastic. Will, if I'm not authorized, I'm sorry, but also at the same time, it was my idea. So you can the <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm so, so happy to, to share that Sweet Tea Shakespeare and Cup of Hemlock are each contributing seven actors um, towards a 14-person ensemble that is going to read a cutting that I have done, a cutting and adaptation that I have done of Shakespeare's As You Like It, which will then be followed by a dramaturgical discussion about what this play can tell us about the world today and why it's an important story to be told now. Um, and uh, Will and I are sort of co-hosting it, we're organizing it, um, and uh, it will be released as a, as a podcast after the fact, and the proceeds will go to Arts Relief in North America. So um, we, as of, as of yesterday, actually, I think our cast lists are pretty much nailed down. Um, and it is a, it is a, an entirely young cast. Uh, I think all of our actors, don't quote me on this, but I think all of our actors are under the age of 35. Um, and we have a, we have a, um, a really diverse array uh, of voices and bodies, which I'm really excited about. Um, we have, it's just an, it's just an amazing lineup of just really wonderful people, many of whom do not know each other. And I'm not just talking about the sort of Canadians not knowing the Americans. Mm -hmm. um, many of my actors have never worked together because I'm pulling them in from different parts of the country. And so um, for us, this just represents, this is like the, this is the apex um, of, of, of um, weaponizing the, the digital platform of Zoom uh, to, to make art and to cross borders making art. Yeah. And something that when we think about theater as this must happen live, must happen in space and time together, like, I feel like so many of these ideas would have never occurred to us before the pandemic right. that, that we just thought, oh, we do our theater here in our town. Maybe we'll bring in a special actor from far or someone will come. But just the fact that, yep, this is something we can do, I think it's wonderful. And it was actually funny that as you like it, how did you decide to do that play? Um, we both wanted to. <laughs> That's fair. I don't know. It, was, I... it, was, it was, you know, it was something that we sort of discussed because I, when I first proposed the idea, I mentioned that we should pick a play that had political resonance today. Um, and I, I stand by that um, because for me, I'm always asking like, why this play, why now? And if I cannot answer that question of why this play, why now? I, do, I, like, I pick a contemporary play by like a woman of color. <laughs> like if we, if we don't have a legitimate reason for doing a classical play, if you're just doing it to do it or you're doing it because it sounds fun, do something else. Um, that's, but that's just my, my personal creed. So um, when he and I sort of started talking about this, we were thinking something like Coriolanus or something that sort of seemed really politically prescient. Uh, and then Will mentioned that he, that he loves As You Like It and has never got to work on it. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've never gotten to work on it either. And I love that play. And um, in terms of, um, in terms of like gender identity, but also gender politics in terms of female agency, uh, in terms of like what it means to usurp power and take power um, for the sake of a tyrannical rule, all of this, that was just feeling really um, meaty and meaningful to us. And also, we we thought it would be, I don't know, sort of spiritually healing, I suppose, for us to to each volunteer seven actors who would come together to tell a story that ends happily. Like that mm -hmm. felt like a really nice. Um, the genre felt appropriate for the kind of 
cross national collaboration and like community we were trying to build. Um, not to say that the tragedies aren't wonderful, that the histories aren't wonderful, the histories are actually my favorite plays, but um, as we're, as we're, as we began to plan it, we thought like, no, this is about making friends. This is about making friends and making alliances and making art across boundaries and borders that once seemed impenetrable, but now, as you say, because of COVID have become more permeable. Um, and so we were like a comedy, a comedy seems right. And a comedy that is often reflective, often melancholy, often, um, you know, often quite devastating, but, but yet that ends happily. Um, that, that felt really important to us. So, um, so we, we sort of landed on As You Like It and on August 1st, Saturday, August 1st, we will all be gathering on Zoom, and we're gonna we're gonna read that funky play. It's great. Yeah, it's. I was surprised, like when you said "as you like it," or when Will first came to us and said that we were doing that, because and like we, the company, I'm not personally involved in it, but like because I know. Well, first of all, Dandelion Theater, the two gents who I uh, interviewed on the very first episode of this interview yeah. series, the cup they had just done a zoom production of as you like it i'm like oh that's i wonder what it is about this play that everyone wants to do it right now i think it's like an interesting like something about it is really touching people at this moment so that's really cool and yeah and i know will obviously is a big fan of it uh one of the plays that was supposed to be in our inaugural season of cup of hemlock that is postponed until to be determined was one that will wrote that's a shakespeare mashup he probably told you about this or yeah where yeah, it's uh, the all the world's a stage monologue of the seven ages of man kind of broken up across the Shakespeare canon. And hopefully we will be able to invite you to see that sometime soon. Oh gosh, I hope so. I need, I need an excuse to go to Toronto. Yeah, it's great. So hopefully one day when the borders are open and the theaters are open, speaking okay. of restoration drama, it kind of feels like there will be a restoration moment after this Cromwell of a virus has done closing all the theaters. <laughs> That is such a that is such a, a beautiful way of putting it. I have been drilling the same thing into my actors' heads. <laughs> um, this is we are in the we are in the puritanical dry spell. Mm -hmm. um, and when theater comes back, I think it is just going to be tr absolutely triumphant. Yeah, I agree. So like you you've kind of touched on this a bit, but uh, might as well ask it. If it's hard to answer, you can just say that. But if you could direct any Shakespeare play, which would it be? <laughs> Here's, I mean, it would be easier to ask which ones I wouldn't direct because there are some that I'm like, I would actually fall asleep in rehearsal and then my actors would hate me. I, I, um, we, could, we could ask that, sure, let's do I, the inverse. Well, like, 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 like Henry VIII, right? Like I'll just yeah, never no, do that. Yeah, nobody wants to do that one. It's cool. just Protestant propaganda. The characters aren't even characters. It's just a disaster. Um, okay, so my favorite, favorite, favorite Shakespeare play is Henry V. And my favorite plays in the canon are the Henry Ads. That's Richard II, yeah, Henry IV, Part One, Part Two, and Henry V. Great, um, love, love them. So yeah. I actually am gearing up to direct Richard II at Sweet Tea Shakespeare, hopefully this winter, but maybe the spring, maybe the summer, maybe mm -hmm. next season. But like Richard II is coming, is nice. the point, and I'm directing it, uh, and that is going to kick off a multi-season Henry Ad in Ooh. Raleigh with the same actors. Sorry, what'd you say? With the same actors, kind of coming back in the oh, few roles that do like. <laughs> as many as can come back because mm -hmm. we're not a Lort theater. So we can't provide yeah. the same housing and um, sort of financial compensation that a professional theater could. So if actors can't come back for their own reasons, I totally understand, mm -hmm. but any that are willing to will be welcome back for as long as their characters are sort of in the, in yeah. the picture. And then even if they're not, even if their character dies, I'm hoping like, for instance, the actor playing Hotspur mm -hmm. will double, will, will play something in part two, just so that the actor sort of sees that, that face again. So, sure. um, so those are the ones that sort of I will always direct, I will always dramaturg, I will I would act in, I would um, I would be like a voice text coach. Like those are just the plays that I will always be happy to get my hands on. Uh, another one is Love's Labor's Lost. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way about LL. Um, Which you recently did the radio play of. I did a reading of. Um, mm -hmm. And so I would say, yeah, I would say the the Henriad, Love's Labors. I don't know if there's any others that I'm like regardless of circumstance, I would do them, but, but those five unequivocally, anytime I will happily direct them over and over again until I die. Maybe mm -hmm. our, I might add R and J to that because yes. I genuinely love Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. um, and that one's always in demand. So you never have to worry yeah. about finding someone to produce it. Definitely. definitely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would say, I would say those are my, those are my go-tos, but, mm -hmm. but follow-up would mm -hmm. do any restoration comedy. Like mm -hmm. if anyone ever was like, 
I want to do this this weird obscure restoration comedy that no one's done in like 50 years. I'd be like, I volunteer because <laughs> I love those plays. Nice. Cool. That sounds great. Uh, yeah, it's funny that you put Love Labor's Lost as one of your favorites because like fans of the show who watch our Love's Labor's video of the Stratford production will know that I never loved that play until I saw that Stratford production and that actually turned me on it and now I'm all in on board with it. It's a shame that it's not still up there because you would probably like it. But I hated it. You hated it, really? I hated it, yeah. I huh. love the play, but I hated that production. I love that production. I'd usually find the play a bore to read. Oh, fascinating. It was, I'm the exact opposite, but that's weird. I Theater. yeah cool <laughs> well this is interesting i'd love to dig into that more but i don't know if we have time for that <laughs> we can have a whole other episode cool. it's just us working, lol nice <laughs> interesting uh yeah so uh that's oh uh, i just had one more question about shakespeare stuff before we can move on to someone who hated shakespeare tolstoy but it's on in the same vein as uh the which one would you like to direct is there any particular role you would like to play yes <laughs> Yes, and I'm not even that good of an actor, but the Princess of France in Love's Labor's Lost is like just epitome of a dream mm -hmm. role for me. Like, mm -hmm. I just and you I just read for her in that radio play. Yeah, for her when we did the full cast reading for Sweet Tea, and it like there were moments that I was just genuinely brought to tears. Um, I don't know if this is too personal for a for a podcast like this, but my my dad's been battling pancreatic cancer, and oh, so I'm sorry to hear um, that. It's I had always loved the play, but that character has has become freshly important to me in a way that she wasn't before. I really understand her mm -hmm. and I really, um, I feel deeply connected to her um, and to her story and to her, her coming of age. And so um, there were moments in the reading that I just, you know, I just found myself like welling up because it mm -hmm. was really, it was really hitting home for me. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and I love that she is the single one of the eight courtiers that is trying so hard to be an adult, but is just, but that, uh, that sort of professionalism is slowly being eroded by the fact that she's having the time of her life, mm -hmm. like making fun of the boys and playing pranks and teasing with her ladies. Like she doesn't want to admit it because she's here to do a diplomatic job. She has a job to do. She wants to prove to her dad that she can do it. She can be the queen. She can like do these sort of royal duties and take it seriously. And yet she's, she's falling head over heels for this nerd. Mm -hmm. um, the, the same guy that her dad wants her to marry, which is like frustrating for her <laughs> and um she's just like she's just starting to allow herself to like let her hair down and enjoy life and that is when the news comes and it's just um my, my dad got sick while I was working on a show in New York right mm -hmm. while I was sort of artistically as fulfilled as I have ever been um so I just I just was really feeling it um so that that character she is she's deeply important to me yeah well Thank you for getting a little too personal on that because that definitely is like good to hear. Like, Richard, I'm sorry to, to hear about your father, of course, but like just hearing that like emotional resonance that that character just makes perfect sense. Yeah. Whew. Well then. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, like we could talk about Shakespeare on just like a whole other episode. But one thing that I really do want to highlight on here, and we can spend the remainder of this episode talking about this, is you have recently written this stage adaptation of something that on this show I have frequently described as my favorite novel, and that is War and Peace. In fact, fun fact, like when I mentioned War and Peace in our King John episode in that little I had already read this little 20 page sample that you shared through uh, the literary managers and dramaturgs of the Americas. And I was shocked when I found out that the person who wrote that was going to be on our show. So like, oh my God, I'm like, oh, I should tell her I read it, but like I didn't get a chance to do it before we started. And then the subject of bastardy came up and I just went for it and threw that little tidbit in there as like a sly. <laughs> They're just like, yes, we have this in common. <laughs> oh my god, and it rocked my world. And I still look back and I cannot believe that I had no idea that you, <laughs> that you knew about it. I just thought it was a great coincidence. I was like, oh, my baby, someone brought up my baby. Um, but I didn't, like, it, it just never occurred to me. And I also, this is the first, it's you saying this right now that makes me realize, I didn't know you had found my LMDA stuff without knowing it was me. I thought that you had just found out I was going to be on the panel and like Googled me. You were like, they, what has she done? <laughs> they happen very close together. Wow. So like, I think you were already on the docket to be on the King John and yeah. forthcoming Othello episodes. 
-hmm. and it was like I saw your name on there but like I didn't connect the dots right away when I saw it. I just got excited ooh new War and Peace adaptation I love this um and then when the moment I found out shortly after that this was the same Claire Martin because it's also a common name as I'm sure yeah. you realize yeah. <laughs> but yeah that was just such an exciting connection to have and from that moment I knew like okay I'm gonna get her on an interview even before I'd even met you on the King John episode of it so I'm glad you're here <laughs> I'm so happy to be here it's just like thank you so much for um for inviting me, but also for saying that, and for, um, I don't, I don't know, just for, for advocating for my work, and for well, giving it this, this broader audience, and allowing me to, to share it, like, I'm just, I'm really humbled. Thank you that. for sending me the rest of the script, because I really enjoyed <laughs> reading it. <laughs> uh, that was, so, that yeah. was a little sneaky, that was a little sneaky on my part, I mean, not sneaky, but it was like, it was a Machiavellian deliberate yeah. choice on my part, because, um, I, and I don't know if I sort of articulated this in so many words to you, but you are the first person who knows the novel who read my plays. Mm -hmm. Everyone else who had who has read them, um, uh, like up to and including the the fourteen extraordinary actors mm -hmm. uh, that I had the privilege of hearing read it aloud uh, in April, like some of some of them had seen like a film, right? Some of yeah. them had an idea of the story. One of them kind of knew the music of Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet, yeah. but no one that I had sent it to in that cast of 14 or in any of my sort of close friends and family were familiar with the actual book. Mm -hmm. And so when you reached out to me after our King John episode and you told me that that had been a, a deliberate <laughs> drop-in uh, and that you had actually seen my, my LMBA sample, which honestly, like, I like jumped up like squealing when I found that out I was so excited and like yeah I'm know. sure I'm not the only one who read it from that when you shared it <laughs> but um but when you said like I I love I it's like my it's my favorite novel I love Tolstoy I've done graduate level work on him I was like whoa this is this is an opportunity for me to kind of float a test balloon I guess mm -hmm. of like how are people who actually are intimately familiar with and sort of profoundly connected to the original source material going to take my plays yeah. because I have changed a lot. <laughs> well, I, I will go on the record now to say that I absolutely loved it. I think it's a wonderful adaptation. I feel like, like I, I've told you this before, but I, as since I'm also a playwright and a dramaturg, I get the challenges of adaptation. So I'm not going to like hold it to the fidelity, like, oh, the book is better, grumble, grumble, grumble. Like, <laughs> uh, but at the same time, being as familiar with the novel I am and having that palimpsestuous pleasure to use Linda Hutchins turn for, you know, engaging with adaptations, I really felt like I could see the gears turning, the machinery at work of how you were approaching pretty much every single decision in it. And each one felt like the correct decision. And I was just like, so kind of bowled over at just how well you've managed such a long, complex, multi-character, difficult to adapt book and really did it justice and made it wholly your own. Like that is a very difficult needle to thread. Thank you so much for saying that. That means the world to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, with that out of the way, and like, of course I can nerd out about this book all day and we'll see how long we continue doing so for on this episode. But let's just start by saying how or, and or why did you decide to adapt War and Peace for the stage? Yeah, it was a spur of the moment decision. As most um, great decisions are. <laughs> yeah, and it actually, I say spur of the moment decision, rereading the book was a spur of the moment decision. Writing the plays was not even a decision. So um, for a bit of context, I had just finished assistant directing a production of Simon, uh, Simon Stevens' Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime nice. at the local regional theater in my hometown of Portland, Oregon, Portland Center Stage. So we had been working on that since January. Um, and that's why Sweet Tea allowed me to sort of start working in mid-March because I had that show happening in the, in the early months of the year. And so, um, uh, a curious Incident is, uh, is a play based on a book uh, about a young man named Christopher um, who decides to sort of investigate uh, the murder of his neighbor's dog. Uh, and Christopher is on the autism spectrum. And what the story is about is his, um, his self-discovery and self-revelation that happens as he sets off to solve this, this, um, this murder, this mystery murder. Um, and the 
the actor who played Christopher at Portland Center Stage daily blew me out of the water um, with his exquisite emotional authenticity, um, with his sort of um, dramatic dexterity, um, and uh, and it, it, he was just he's just a beautiful actor um, and profoundly connected to the character. Um, his name is Jamie Sanders and. Uh, he, he is neuroatypical, He's, uh, he has Tourette syndrome, um, and he brought a, a just profound compassion for, for Christopher, and he advocated for him, and, um, and, and told that story in such a sort of breathtakingly visceral and realistic way that I came away from Curious Incident being like, I just, I want to work with that kid again. <laughs> like, I just, I just want, I want to, I want to collaborate with Jamie again, in addition to being a great actor, he's also a great person. I wouldn't have felt that if he, you know, was not. Um, he's a wonderful, wonderful human being all around. Um, he's very funny and vigorous, and um, he just has, a, like, just a great sense of play. And so, um, I know that that seems, like, so completely irrelevant, but it, it is relevant, I promise, because... I, I know how it's relevant, but let the yeah, audience you know. <laughs> go on this journey so, with you. <laughs> so, um, the, so, Curious Vincent opens, uh, and, and then, or, and then the state of Oregon gets shut down. The show closes, Jamie, who was supposed to be in my, in my city for six weeks, uh, has to go back to New York. All the actors sort of scatter to the winds, and the show is closed down, and we are all sort of in mourning for the fact that only about seven audiences ever got to see the show um and um it was that day it was the day that governor kate brown announced that oregon was going to have a uh, state issue quarantine um for at least three weeks um that i was like i need a story right now about about people specifically young people uh enduring and and overcoming what feels to be a an insurmountable cosmic obstacle right something that they cannot control but that they have to go up against because i was like i need to find hope somewhere and i hadn't read i hadn't read war and peace since i was in high school um i read i read it all the way through when i was um 16 when i was a sophomore um in high school and um and and loved it for for all its for all its flaws and foibles i loved it um i loved i loved the story i, I found many details really difficult to swallow, but I loved the, the story. Um, and I loved the way that there was a, there was an outer, uh, socio-political sphere of like war and class and history that was like, that inside of it was, was nesting this much smaller, more intimate personal sphere, um, of family relationships and romantic entanglements and allyship and friendship, right? So that these, these two, these two, like, it's almost like a Russian doll, right? Like this, holds this. So I, that was what I loved about the, about the book. And when quarantine happened, I was like, fuck, I haven't read it since I was 16. Um, and like, I'd read parts of it since then. I'd read chapters, but I had never, I hadn't opened up the book in a real way in a decade. So I was like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna start reading it because I'm stuck at home anyway. I technically haven't started my, my new job at Sweet Tea yet. So I'm like, I, and I may not even have the job right anymore. So I was like, I'm just going to reread this book. So I read it overnight. Um, not, not again, not really intentionally. I started reading it and I just couldn't stop. And uh, about whatever it was, 16 hours later, um, I sort of, I got, I got to the end, I closed the book. I got through that ridiculous epilogue and I closed it and I sat down on my computer and I just started writing. And uh, in five minutes, I pounded out a five-page scene that has become uh, scene one mm -hmm. of life. Um, and as I was writing, the, from the first moment that Pierre sort of starts talking, um, I realized that I, was, that I was trying to emulate Jamie's voice. I realized that I was, I was writing the voice in my head of Pierre was not the voice that was in the text. It was Jamie's voice. And he was talking to me. He was telling me the way he would say the lines. So instead of taking the lines from the book, I was like looking at like, what is Pierre saying? What is the gist of what he's saying? And in my head, what was happening was there was this unconscious translation of it coming out in, in Jamie's voice in his very specific idiosyncratic syntax. And I got to the end of the scene and I was like, oh my God, like, it's just Jamie. <laughs> like, I've just, I've, I have probably because I missed him. I was like, I was like, I just, he's in New York now. I just miss him. Um, it, it may have been nostalgia. I don't know. But I got to the end of the scene and I was like, oh my God, there's something here. I have to keep going. And then I didn't stop writing for a week and a half. And I wrote, I wrote two full length plays, <laughs> parts one and two.
not just two but pulling plates. Two. Was, I didn't. I didn't sleep for a week. I didn't like. Yeah. My parents were so rude about me. They had to like force food into my mouth because I like, wasn't coming down to eat. Like I was a train wreck. I was just writing and writing and writing. About halfway through part one, I realized that one of the other main characters, Andre, that there was this guy in my head that I was like, oh my god, this is like a perfect role for him. And I realized that like his personality was sort of informing the way I was writing Andre. And then I get to the end of part one and I start part two and I realized that like the character of Natasha, that there's like, a friend of mine who's informing. So like by the time I got to the end of both parts, I was like, it wasn't, it wasn't that I was like, I'm writing it, uh, I'm writing it to be performed, but I did come to the end of it and I was like, I want to hear these three actors mm -hmm. read it out loud because on some level they had all influenced the way that I had transposed the characters from Tolstoy uh, to my own, my own creations. Um, so yeah, I, I wrote them very fast. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> that is such an amazing little like story of how you just decided to do it on the fly, how you wrote the whole thing in under two weeks, which is crazy. Yeah. It took me longer than that to read the book. Like, <laughs> and you wrote an entire adaptation of it. Like in geez, like, it, yeah, it's, it's just everything about that is remarkable. And like, yeah, and, and it's like we're kind of skipping ahead in like my chronology of the questions, but since you brought it up anyway, I think it didn't know it's don't don't apologize, it's great. I think just the yeah, the decision to make Pierre uh, neurodivergent in here really does inform the piece in this like very interesting way. And what I find so interesting about it, the way you said that, like I was looking at what's Pierre saying and then turning it into Jamie's voice. To me, when I was reading the script, it still felt like Pierre's voice to me. And like, right. I think there is something like, I don't want to say like, Pierre has always been neurodivergent or I, although maybe there is a disability studies reading we could do of the text yeah. with that. It's also worth noting that that's the character that Tolstoy most closely based on himself, if yeah. you want to like, but yeah, uh, just, yeah, it feels very like, even though you've changed all the lines, it still feels like you have cut to the core of what is being said and how it feels like it's always been said in there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, you, you've sort of pointed out something that I think I only obliquely uh, alluded to, which is that I, I ended up committing to that choice, right? Like, I didn't go back and rewrite scene one. I, in fact, scene one hasn't changed since I first wrote it. It is exactly the way it was when I, when I first put uh, fingers to the keyboard. But, um, but I, I committed to, to doing the whole thing with, with Pierre intended to be performed by a neuroatypical actor. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. Like, you need to yeah. get that representation in whatever, certainly whatever few roles are open to it, but even more so beyond that if we can. Like, yeah. So fantastic, perfect choice to make there and a perfect character, I think, to do it with. And, and the main character, one of the three main characters, like there are very few lead roles for you know, neurotypical performers, so fantastic. Uh, so you mentioned briefly that uh, while no, no one in your cast had like uh, actually read the novel, they were familiar with some previous adaptations, and there have been a lot of them. Uh, what is your prior experience with some of the stage and screen adaptations before, and did you draw any direct influence from them? Yeah, I, I'm supposed to say no, <laughs> but I, I owe quite a bit to uh, to Mr. Andrew Davies and his 2016 mm -hmm. miniseries. Um, I would say, I'd say mostly, mostly because what Davies did that I profoundly appreciate is he let the characters be young mm -hmm. and sound young and make young foolish mistakes he let them live in that 20 something state um and even though you you watch them grow and develop across the, the six episodes i'm referring to the 2016 yeah. miniseries bbc did um there is it's baked into their lines right it's, it's not just a matter of casting he wrote the scripts to be the story of young people really coming of age, all of them, in their own in their own way, and um, that felt so like it's like it's almost technically a revision, um, not of the book but of the adaptations that had preceded it, mm -hmm. because there is this weird and to my mind disheartening trend um, of of casting sometimes Andre but almost always Pierre as like a like grizzled middle-aged man who's mm -hmm. just like misanthropic and like thinks that his is just obsessed with the fact that he's not as physically attractive as other people and like I just I don't yeah. I'm so I'm so sick of I'm so sick of that narrative I'm so sick of those actors I'm so mm -hmm. sick of that 
protagonist figure. Um, and which like is Paul so Dano awesome. is an interesting choice for the role because he is yeah. an adult technically, but he looks so young and like has looks this young. like yeah real youthfulness yeah. to him. Yeah, yeah, he's he's boyish, <laughs> and also he's he's vulnerable. He's willing. He as an actor, Paul Dano is just willing to be like almost painfully, viscerally vulnerable, <laughs> and. Um, and that is, that is Jamie's superpower as well, right? Like those are the actors I most respond to. Ben Wishot, when I worked with Ben, that is, that is, that is his great power and majesty is that he will bear his soul on stage. And so, um, you know, Pierre is, is an idealist, um, who is just like ride or die for his friends. Um, he, he has big dreams and he doesn't know how to achieve them. Um, he just, he is so millennial to me, right? Mm -hmm. And I, regardless of what the, the book never actually really specifies his age. Um, sometimes he comes across as an old man, but other times we're reminded that he was in school not that long ago. So like, mm -hmm. I, I, Tolstoy, I don't know. Like, you're gonna have to come out of your grave and tell me what you meant. But um, he, refer, he refers to Natasha as his protege, which is super like creepy and lecherous, mm -hmm. but also like calls her his friend sometimes, which I like, that yeah. doesn't act for me. So I don't know. But to me in the book, if I, if I strip away the details about like, how he looks and Tolstoy's weird sort of self-insert trend with him. What I read is a millennial. Mm -hmm. And and what I liked about Davies' adaptation was that he let kind of the main players, um, all the siblings, right? Natasha, Nikolai, Sonia, Helene, mm -hmm. Anatole, Maria, uh, even, even Andre to a certain extent, Pierre, like he let them be young. And in the text that they spoke there, you really got a sense that like, these are young people who actually have not seen or experienced that much of the world and have been fairly privileged and or protected by their sort of social class and for the women, like their, their lack of agency and freedom. Mm -hmm. And so when you watch that miniseries, by the time you get to the end, you really feel like you've seen them grow up. And that to me is what I love about the book is that there is this maturation that happens and this, this development of wisdom and community. They, they, these young characters, they all find faculties in themselves that they didn't know they possessed. They find bravery, they find compassion, forgiveness in themselves that they didn't know they could conjure. Um, it just, to me, it's just a story of many comings of age, you know? And so I think Davies gets at the heart of that better than any other adaptation I've ever seen. I've seen all of the films. Um, I've seen that adaptation. I have listened to Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet, but I've never mm -hmm. seen it. Um, and so, yeah, unfortunately, Davies, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, some of your, some of your brilliant sort of heel turns and like scene transitions and mm -hmm. some of your conceits I, I stole because they were just too good not to. I'm sure he'd be flatter. <laughs> who, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Uh, do you have any like thoughts? Like, cause like the most popular one right now, I think probably is like Great Comet just cause it yeah. won all those Tonys and whatnot. But like, uh, what do you have thoughts on that? Do you think the book works as a musical? I have opinions, but I'd love to hear yours. <laughs> I appreciate that it centers Natasha. Mm -hmm. Like more, that is like my biggest takeaway. Um, it centers Natasha in a way that does not diminish her to her sexuality or blame her for the events of what happens or, um, or try to, um, or try to use her as some like figure with which to titillate the audience. I appreciate that it centers her in a way that allows her agency, self-actualization. Um, it's not that she doesn't make mistakes. It's not that she isn't flawed, but like she is allowed to be a protagonist as opposed to the object of desire for either the, the spectator or for another character. So in that respect, I, I cannot not like it because it, it does work for me that is just too, has been too long in coming, right? Of really allowing her to be a full character. Um, and I also, I also appreciate that, that adaptation for um, investing in the friendship, the trust and the camaraderie between Pierre and Natasha. Um, because that to me is, is an aspect of the book that Tolstoy doesn't, uh, he doesn't let it be clear because the, the waters are so muddy regarding his age and like what he really thinks of her and feels for her. And like, you don't really understand like why they trust each other because he seems kind of creepy. And so I, I, in the book, it's, it's, it's all muddy, their relationship. And when she's like, oh, you're so kind, I trust you. I'm like, why? <laughs> um, but in, in Natasha Pierre, like the, the musical goes out of its way 
to um, to wet the ground for their romance, but also just for their just their bond as people, their like soul bond. Um, and so, for, those are my favorite things about it. I think some of the music is brilliant. I think the um, I think it's fun. Like I think it's just a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And that I think is something that I did steal from it in my adaptation. Is I was like, where's where are the moments where the actors can just play? Where are the moments of humor? Where are the moments of levity? And I think that that, that musical is really attuned to the need for levity in a story that can be so tragic. Um, so yeah, that's, that's about where I am with it. Nice. Good answer. And like that segues into something else I really wanted to talk about, about your adaptation. You've done a lot of great work to like really flesh out and amplify the female characters in this novel. And if you want to just comment on that, I think that's one of the really remarkable things about what you've done here that I think you've even surpassed great comment in that regard, but in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and I, I should say also, like, in, in the defense of Great Comet, it only is, like, 70 pages of the book. Mm -hmm. so yes. and you've done the entire the, book. <laughs> I've done the whole thing. So a lot of the, a lot of the development of characters in, in Great Comet, you never get to see because it actually happens after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, That's a good I, point. <laughs> I'll, still, I'll, still, I'll still take the compliment because I'm a nurse. So, um, okay. Thank you for saying that. Um, it is... It's hard, it's hard to explain um, intentionality with regard to War and Peace um, because I didn't really intend to write it. I didn't plan it. I didn't have notes. I didn't have a plot outline. I didn't know it was going to be two plays until I got like three quarters into what is now part one, right? Scene 38. There's about 100 scenes in total, 50-50. Um, until I was on scene 38, and I was like, wow, I'm only like a third of the way into this book. Um, so, so it wasn't even like... I didn't even have a plan for how long the thing was going to be. I was just writing. And so I can't claim that I was like careful about my choices with the women. Um, at least not as careful as I absolutely could have been. On the flip side though, and I don't know if any other sort of female writers or creators are listening to this, but if they are like, I would go out on a limb and say, I'm probably not alone as a, as a non cisgendered male creator, um, in finding it actually easy mm -hmm. to empower the women, not like, like you have to be willing to change stuff from the source material to materials. You, you have to sort of release yourself from the obligation to be true to the source material. But if you can do that, if you can like unfetter yourself from that, um, I, I feel like most of the women writers that I know, it's as natural as breathing mm -hmm. to, to give agency and, and a greater, a more amplified voice and a more centric role in the story to female characters. Like, I just, I don't know, like I, it, we almost do it organically. We like, because it just makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Like it just makes sense to, to lift up the voices of ourselves because we know we have been shut out of history and we know that we have been marginalized. And I, I'm a privileged white woman. I can't even speak for the, 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 um, the BIPOC female writers that I know, the queer female writers that I know. Like it's a different, like there's all levels of intersectionality here that I'm not really covering. But um, in terms of just like, for instance, taking, taking a character like Natasha who is mythic in her ingenueness um, and being like, I'm, I'm just gonna write a really, impatient, you know, impetuous, curious young woman. Mm -hmm. That's just what I'm going to write because that's true. That's, and that honors the female experience and that honors womanhood in a way that Tolstoy never could. So um, <clears throat> it was never, it was never a conscious choice. It was just a thing that I, that I did um, mm -hmm. because it, it didn't make sense not to. Yeah. I know that's a, a kind of a convoluted answer. No, sorry but it's, that. it is it's certainly the value that. of having a female adapter bringing that perspective into it, something that probably wouldn't have occurred to Tolstoy or the, many of the scores of male right. adapters who have taken a crack at it over the years. And yeah. yeah, like, Natasha, you certainly, like, got into how, yes, you made this, like, and she's already, like, the most central female character in the book anyway, yeah. and, like, while she is this, like, er, ingenue, certainly you did find ways to, like, just, yeah, make her kind of worthy of the prominence she has in the story. Uh, others that I think are certainly worth noting is, like, Maria, you've done a lot of work to kind of really, like, dig into her relationship with her brother, Andre, which, as we, we've talked about this before, but you, you really felt that it's so bizarre that she's not present 
at his, spoiler alert, Andre dies, <laughs> at, at the scene of his death, <laughs> that when he, like, Natasha's there, they've had, like, what, maybe, like, a month-long relationship tops, and his sister, who he's been with his whole life, doesn't get to say goodbye to him in that way, so the fact that you put all of that in there, I think, is, like, extraordinary and great. Making Helene a likable and sympathetic character, again, it probably just goes into this is second nature for you as a female playwright, but I think that is, like, such a kind of one-note borderline villain character in the book that I, like, when reading it, really felt for her in ways that I never have, like, in the book or even a previous adaptation. I've actually seen other adaptations that just cut her out entirely, that she's just, like, spoken of as an offstage character, but... Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, um... I'm sorry, I, I might be interrupting you. No, but go I, ahead. I want to. I want to. You're the guest. <laughs> no, but I really, I really appreciate you saying this, and I, um, I think second nature is, is a great way to describe it. Um, with with regard to Maria, I again, I, I owe something not only to to Andrew Davies, but especially to the goddess that is Jesse Buckley, who plays mm -hmm. her in the 2016 yeah. adaptation, because um, Jesse was playing against type with Maria. Mm -hmm. Jesse is actually like a full, vibrant, kind of extroverted presence, typically. Mm -hmm. um, and she, she like, she reined it in and she like, like sucked it in to, to play this, this emotionally abused, um, deeply pious, but like still kind of disillusioned young woman who is so lonely and mm -hmm. so scared all of the time. Um, and, and I, th I thought that her performance in the 2016 miniseries was like, it was a revelation the first time I watched it because mm -hmm. there was this um, real compassion for her that I sensed in Jesse's portrayal. And I, I, think that, I think that Davies laid the groundwork for that. I think that in his version, he gives Maria enough text, enough screen time, and enough of a journey that, that an actor could sort of make that investment. But also like she just, she, ex you know, uh, exceeded any expectation I could possibly have had for that portrayal. Um, and so I, I definitely drew inspiration from, from that specific track in my, in my adaptation, but I tried to take it further than that because I'm a sister. I'm mm -hmm. a sister. I, I have a brother. Um, it's just the two of us. And in War and Peace, we have Nikolai and Natasha. We have Helen and Anatole. We have Maria and Andre. And even Dolokhov has a sister who we never meet, but he has a sister that he's profoundly devoted to. Like brothers and sisters and the bond between siblings, especially siblings of different genders, that is like, that is central in the book. And that doesn't mean that it's always centered by Tolstoy, but it is central to understanding what happens in the story and to understanding all of the character dynamics. And as a sister of a brother, I just was like, I can't discount that or, or sideline that for the sake of romantic relationships that, as you say, can last a month, can come and go. Like family bonds, they start when, when the siblings are born, right? Like they start from birth. And um, with, with Maria, I had the extraordinary pleasure and honor of having my friend Claire Whitman uh, read for her in the full cast readings and, and give me feedback on, on how I had written Maria's character. And what we came to was that Maria is a slow burn. Maria doesn't even flourish into herself until a third of the way into part two. Mm -hmm. she's, she's one of the last ones that we see really come into her own and claim her agency. Um, but it's so, I, I, I wanted I wanted Maria's arc to be one that actually bent further than just um, self, like just drawing strength and self-confidence from herself, which is kind of where Tolstoy leaves her, that she sort of finds a way to advocate for herself. Um, I wanted to take it a step further and I wanted her to become a real leader. I wanted us to watch her become the kind of compassionate, selfless, like group oriented, wise female leader that we are so desperately in need of in the world today, right? The people that are, that are gentle and kind, the women that are gentle and kind and still willing to step up and lead, even if they are kind of intimidated by, by being in charge, um, but they do it because it, 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 because it must be done and they, they, they care too much about their team members not to. But, like that just, that seemed like, uh, writing that was an antidote to, to living in America with the kind of toxic male leadership that we have. Like, mm -hmm. writing that for me was almost cathartic. 
Um, and to me, it was like, I wanted Nikolai's love for her to come from a place of not just, oh, she, like, I find her attractive or like, oh, I, I saved her life. Cause he, he hits this weird, like knight in shining armor complex in the book that I thought was kind of stupid. Um, I wanted it to come from a place of like, he is just profoundly admiring of her. Like he just sees her in action and is like, whoa. Um, so, so that was where I, that was where I tried to sort of like carry her to. And I, and in terms of the siblinghood, I was like, she loves her brother more than anything in the world. Like, mm -hmm. that's what we first learn about her. And, and he loves her more than anything. Like, before he finds Natasha, he, I don't think he loves anyone in the world, including mm -hmm. himself, more than he loves his sister. And so um, it was, yeah, there was, there, was a, there was a sibling, there was a duty to siblinghood that I felt called to, to do. There was a, a, um, a call to show female leadership that I felt like was sort of needed. Um, all of those things were sort of, were sort of conflating. And then there was just this fact that I just wanted the women to have at least half the dialogue. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just wanted them to talk at least half as much as the men. Yeah. Um, and so I tried to create parody wherever, wherever possible. Mm -hmm. And one female character who we haven't mentioned yet, but as you know, she's my favorite, not just in this book, but in all of world literature is Sonia, who like, yeah, and I don't even think you, like, correct me if I'm wrong, you would know better than I did, but I don't even feel like you had to do anything to her. I just think she's just a great character and, like, yeah. you, and, like, part of the, like, what's worked so well with her, and you certainly brought this out in the adaptation, is just how she's very understated in all the scenes, but she's always watching, always observing. She's, she's, like, I, when reading the book, I feel like she's me in this scenario off to the sidelines being like, but don't do that. That's a bad idea. And like, yes, listen to Sonia. Like, and, and uh, something I think that you did excellently with her is you gave her more agency in her not so happy ending. Spoiler alert again. Sorry, there's going to be spoilers to this very old book. People just, you should have read it by now, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think, yeah, just, I felt like there was justice for Sonia <laughs> in there, which, yeah, I really appreciated. Um, and like, it's not even just the female characters, while well, that's like the very obvious, like, departure from the book. I think like a lot of the male characters, you did so much like one example that I think is worth mentioning is Dolokhov, who you mentioned briefly has this relationship with his sister that again, we never see. But Dolokhov is like this one note, like, I, I'm reluctant to even call him an antagonistic character in there. He's just like a, he's like a tertiary thug kind of character. He's like Anatol's henchman, basically. But like, uh, but and something that I think is like wonderful that you didn't hear is, you cut the character of Denisov, who I love. How can you not love Denisov? He's so lovable. Yeah, yeah he's just like this pure, delightful little, <laughs> wonderful character in here. But like, does he have a lot of bearing on the plot? No you're adapting a very long book, you can cut him, it's fine. But the fact that you had Dolokhov have that moment with Petya that's in the book, Dolokhov and Denisov together, and Dolokhov just shrugs it off and Denisov is the one who feels it, that you kind of, it almost feels like it's by accident, but I'm sure it wasn't, you gave Dolokhov this arc <laughs> that he just like otherwise, just like he comes in in these few scenes, like in the book where he just like creates obstacles for the main characters and yeah, but otherwise you've done a great job of really fleshing. I could talk about every single character <laughs> in what you've done here, but we should probably move on to other topics. Uh, I, but see, say, yeah. I would like to say one thing about in regards to Dolokhov that's just, it mm -hmm. actually relates to how it's sort of written all the men in this play. Um, so Jack Loudon, who played Nikolai in the 2016 miniseries, mm -hmm. I got to see him play Angelo in, measure, in Josie Works mm -hmm. Measure for Measure at the Donmar in London revelatory he did it mm -hmm. in his own Scottish accent and it was chef's kiss beautiful um and he's I just think he's a, I just think he's a glorious young actor um and I loved I loved his Nikolai um but I read an interview with him when I was gearing up to see Measure for Measure in London where um Jack Loudon had said that he likes playing male characters that have to confront masculinity in some way <laughs> male characters that like are that maybe are um, on paper, they look like they should be the stereotypical hero, um, but that those roles are like, those roles are interrogating what it means to be a man and what it means to be heroic in some way. And so he likes to take roles that like, it doesn't necessarily mean the man has to be evil. It just means that like, he wants to play male characters where the question of masculinity is something the character ends up having to contend with. 
right? Mm -hmm. So when he played Nikolai, for instance, he, he was able to play up Nikolai's petulance. He was able to play up his selfishness. He was able to play up his, his like blinders mm -hmm. um, and, and his, his kind of like Epicurean uh, love of uh, decadence, you know, despite the fact that his family can't afford it. Like so, so many pieces of, of Nikolai that are like really unflattering. He was able to bring to the surface while also at the same time, fully investing in Nikolai's heart of gold, in his love for his sister, in his devotion to his family, like in his genuine like guilt at, at throwing over Sonia. Like, um, and I remembered that interview when I sort of started the Dolokhov trajectory and I knew I was going to have him be the, I wanted to give him an arc and I wanted to get rid of Denny Sob and sort of have Dolokhov be the one that goes on that single journey. Um, I was thinking about that, that interview with Jack Loudon and I was like, what if every single male, what if every single male character, I make them confront masculinity in some way? What if at some point every single one of them says or does something that is not what we would expect from the archetypal male character that they are? And so that was my, that was my, that was my, that was my home base for every single male character. I was like, I want a moment, whether it's a moment of vulnerability, whether it's a moment of quote unquote feminine behavior, whatever the hell that is. Like I wanted a moment of um, real, realization that like they wanted something that was that was not sort of socially acceptable whatever it was i just wanted all of them to to have to rub up against masculinity in some way um and i think dolokhov was the first mm -hmm. like real example of that yeah and like i like that you didn't take the obvious route on that because with dolokhov like i feel like tolstoy gives us an easy in for that if you wanted to take it of right after the duel with pierre he goes to visit his family we see his mother yeah. and sister like that could have been that moment but then you really like took this whole other just like giving him this longer because that scene would happen very early on with right after the right. duel and his family and it would have been just like a very like quick sort of like oh maybe he's not so bad after all but then still does all the stuff with Anatol in the second right. play <laughs> so like the fact that you let our kind of last moment with Dolokhov or one of the last few ones be this scene with Petya where you don't have Denisov anymore I think really like worked and yeah and for such a such an otherwise dislikable character. I think you did a great job. Um, yeah, so we've talked about this a little bit, but I would love to hear you kind of dig into this more, that you had a very unique way of dramaturging this piece and with what you call your golden trio of actors. And I think this, I've never heard of like dramaturgy been done this way before, but I think it's very unique and I think it should be done more often now that I've heard about it. So if you want to describe how did this work, Again, it's, it wasn't intentional. It wasn't a thing that I was like, I'm going to set out to do this. Um, I just got very, very lucky. So um, the first thing that happened was I, I organized a full cast reading. Um, 14 wonderful actors from all across America volunteered to, to do a Zoom with me. Um, and they each read for one of the tracks. Um, and I got to hear it out loud. We did part one on a Tuesday and part two on a Thursday. Um, and coming out of that, um, the three actors that I had that I had in mind for the sort of three central characters of Pierre, Andre, and Natasha, they had all uh, agreed to do the reading. So I actually got to hear the three of them read for those characters in the full cast sessions. <laughs> and coming out of that, um, I was texting with uh, Bernardo, uh, who, who read for Andre, um, who I think is actually going to be a podcast guest on Will's new podcast, ah. Cup of Unlock sometime soon. Cool. Um, I was messaging with him, uh, and, you know, he had been, let's say, underwhelmed with part one, hmm. but he really liked part two. And he's a dramaturg whose opinion I, I value very highly. And so I was like, I was a little bit defensive because, again, I had just written the plays. Uh, and also that's just in my nature. But I was like, okay, so why, why would he not have loved part one? Like part one is when Andre falls in love with Natasha. Like part one is when there's so much joy in Andre's life. So I was like, what, what is it? What is it? What is it? And, and I realized that like, Andre just didn't have enough stage time. Like he just didn't have enough scenes to fully explain why he, like the emotional journey that he went on. We didn't see enough of him at home. We didn't see enough of him with his sister. We didn't see enough of him with Natasha. Like we just didn't see enough of him. Mm -hmm. um, and I should have said this earlier, but when I first finished the, the projects, part one was actually shorter than part two. It is now longer, but it was originally shorter than part two uh, in terms of length and, and word, word count. Right. And I was like, wow. Well, I was like, part one really clips along to the point that like, a lot isn't explained. So I was like, what if I like, wrote some more content for, for Andre specifically that would help us track the sign curve of his character in part one that would then allow us to like roll into part two in which he has this like 
tremendous emotional arc um, in a more satisfying way. And uh, what I asked him as I was like, would you ever be willing to just get on Zoom with me and, and do some scene work slash inventing? Like, would you be willing to read some new scenes, some new material and give me feedback, not just as an actor, but as like a dramaturg of like, is this working in the full script and in the full story? Um, and he was like, absolutely, like, let's do some explorative work. I'm, I'm down. And then I was like, well, I would want, I would want the characters that are most central to Andre's emotional arc, but also like, if I'm doing this for Andre, I might as well do this for the other two main protagonists, because there are three of them. And, and in my adaptation, they really do pass the baton of like when, who has the most agency and who is the central character. Like they're just passing it off between them, between each other. Um, Cause I didn't know how else to, I didn't know how else to do it. Um, and so I reached out to Jamie Sanders and Amanda Fallon Smith, uh, who had read for Natasha. And I was like, hey, would you guys be willing to join me and Bernardo on Zoom sometime to read some new scenes and give me feedback, but also to give me feedback on the plays overall? Like, would you be willing to give me dramaturgical feedback on like what they're doing for you, what you think they say about the world, but then also sort of step in and be actors needed? And both of them were like, yes, 100%. So suddenly I had this I, a sort of agreement between the four of us that we were just gonna meet intermittently and just work, but we didn't really define like what that work was going to be. We were just like, we're just gonna like work on the plays and just figure out stuff as we go. Um, and for two weeks, we met like every other day on Zoom. And um, I had I had a bunch of new scenes, mostly for part one, but also I had some edits because I, I was taking notes when I heard the full cast reading. So I had edits that I was going in and doing for, for both parts. Um, so the scripts were starting to, to, to transform and develop. Uh, and I was sending the actors new material all the time, like, hey, look at this scene. Hey, look at this rewrite of this scene. Hey, look, what if I, what if I inverse, what if I do this scene before this scene? And so I'm sort of sending them all of this via email. And then we get on Zoom. Some of it we read, some of it I work with them as a director, them as actors. And we're like, so how would this, how would this work? How does this work on a, on a, how do, what are the merits of this thing as a piece of theater, as a piece of like scene work for, for characters? But then we would also step back and the, the three of them would give me insight as to what that new piece or new edit um, or lack of edit was doing to the script as a whole, right? And what we realized was that the, the three of them were sort of interchanging their actor identity and their dramaturgy identity. And they were sort of flipping hats based on what I needed. Sometimes within breaths, they were switching hats. And I was going between playwright and director, and I was sort of changing hats. And so everything just felt really malleable. Um, and everything, it was, it was very democratic. Like they, they had the agency to just say whatever they wanted and to give me whatever feedback they wanted, whether it was actorly or dramaturgical, um, because we weren't in a room rehearsing together. So there wasn't any kind of like hierarchy of like me behind a table, them on stage. We were all just sitting in front of our laptops. And so because of that, you know, they were able to say things to me that I don't even know if they would have done if we were in a room together, right? Like Amanda at one point was like, she's like, she said something to me, she was like, where's Natasha's fire? Like she, like where, when, when can she be mean? When can she be wrong? When can she be messy? Cause she's too, she's still too perfect, Claire. She's still too perfect. She's still an ingenue. And um, Amanda who has played more ingenues than she can count, like it's just so, she is bringing her own sense of being fed up with that, with that lot um, to the table. And so all three of them had just like, ah, oh, just dazzling insights and such useful feedback for me. Um, that was sometimes very specific to like this line of text and sometimes it was really broad like why are you having them speak to each other in you know 19th century jargon when they're already broaching the rules of propriety and like hugging each other like why not just let them speak colloquially so like things like that were happening too um I'm doing a bad job of giving like an no, a I'm just getting too excited about it but it was like it was the most extraordinary collaborative experience of my life it was it was just it was so cool yeah, and I think it's just, it, this feels like a no-brainer, but I don't know why we don't do it more often, that the, let the actors originating these roles be the dramaturgs and really have their own insights into what's going on with these characters and what they should be doing and what they could be doing interestingly differently. And I think, like, it's almost impressive that you did this with an adaptation where I feel like there's more squeamishness around, oh, there has to be some semblance of fidelity, whereas if it was a completely original work that you did the same process with, anything can be changed. It feels like there's that freedom. Yeah, That's wanna... a really good point. But I think, and I think that those three of them, Jamie, Amanda, and Bernardo, were integral in helping me fully break the chains. Any lingering, any lingering fidelity I had to Tolstoy, 
they helped me cut through those wires um, <laughs> because they insisted they insisted on me writing what was true as opposed to writing what was in the book, right? Yeah. What is what is true on stage is not necessarily what is going to be true in a 19th century novel, right? It's a different, it has a different kind of life and it's a different set of responsibilities, right? As a storyteller, I have a different set of responsibilities in telling this story in the 21st century. And so um, what was great was that the three of them were simultaneously originating the roles helping to define what the roles were and what purpose they served in the story and who they really were as people. Um, but also they were just dramaturging the plays, like mm -hmm. overall, like they would step out of their characters entirely and just be like, they would just look at the whole story and be like, so what's Anatole's deal, right? Like they would do that work as well, where they were like, did he have a, like, was he, did he know his mother? Like, is he missing some female figure in his life? Like they were able to just like zoom in and out. Um, and what I came away from it, what I came away from uh, was in addition to like profound gratitude is I was like, man, actors are really smart. Yeah. Like actors are smart and capable and genius and they're not just actors. I don't think any actor that is really an actor is, is just an actor. They are inherently dramaturgs, mm -hmm. but sometimes they're not empowered to be in the yeah. room. And so I think in new play development, you just have this opportunity to like, bring in the minds of people who are going to be able to like look for context and like juicy you know structural stuff and also just get inside a character's emotional interiority as well mm -hmm. yeah so that's a note to playwrights and directors and literary managers in the future let your actors be dramaturgs that you will yeah. be richer for it yes that's great yeah so thank you for sharing that and hopefully we'll see more of that happening on the horizon uh, so you've mentioned that, I think, to kind of just veer off into a slightly different tangent, but obviously War and Peace is a famously long text, I think, to most people who haven't read it. That's the one thing they know about it, is just shorthand for a very long book. <laughs> um, uh, so I, did, I think you made the very wise decision to break it up into two plays, because it would have been crazy to do it as one. Uh, my, my question for you is, do you think either of the two units can work in isolation or would it only make sense to do them together as a pair? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question because it actually came up uh, in our full cast readings. Uh, one of my dear colleagues, Jordan Beck, um, he, after each, after reading part one and part two, he facilitated a full group discussion uh, where they used Liz Lerman's critical response model and I was just able to sit and listen to my actors respond to the plays um, as they were in their very first draft format. <laughs> Um, and this was a question that, that the actors had and that the actors wanted to discuss, um, this question of, of isolation and the possibility of doing one or the other. Um, I think in terms of just sheer, like, uh, sense and, and I don't know, I'm, I, I don't know, the, I don't know the right ad, uh, the right word for this, but, um, you cannot do part two alone only because there is no exposition. Mm -hmm. There's not like, I, I, there's nothing in part two to foreground really who these characters are. There's a, there's a scene at the beginning that is an overlay. Uh, it, it's a, it's an interpolation of the czar, czar Alexander the first actual real letter that, that he sent to Napoleon asking him to desist when Napoleon was invading. And then a note from Annette, uh, Anna Pavlovna Shiafa from the book, who's the hostess of the Petersburg Salon, and I had her writing this fictional letter to a friend detailing the events of Natasha Rostova's attempted suicide. Um, and, no, oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but, but even that doesn't explain who Natasha is, and we don't, we don't even see Pierre in part two until halfway through act one. So, like, yeah. I just don't know how you would do it in a way that would be satisfying for an audience because they just wouldn't know who anyone was or any of yeah. how anyone related to each other and like i think those letters like as far as exposition goes is good for if you had to split it up over two nights or like a week apart yeah. between the shows that would remind the audience of what they'd already seen but it doesn't give them that if they hadn't seen it yeah right and that's why i wrote it i wrote it thinking an audience would have seen part one maybe as many as 24 hours before and would need a refresher on the most important or salient plot details but it doesn't introduce the characters as characters. Mm -hmm. The problem is, 
is that part two is actually much more congealed as a play. Like, I think it actually works as a better play because it's only trying to cover like eight months of time as opposed to seven years, which is what part one does. Part two is literally just Napoleon's invasion. It is, it is, it is just the war of war and peace. That's it. Mm-hmm. Part one is the six and a half years that precede it that goes war and then peace and then threat of war again. And it's just like, it's, there's just so much more packed in you, the, there's more characters that have big roles. Like you see, there's just more players on the board in part one, part two, I really focus in. Um, and that's because I, I've earned it, right? By part two, we know who the characters are, so I can really get psychologically deep with them, and I can give them longer scenes. In part one, I have to keep it moving, and I have to, like, have these really short interchanges just so the audience knows these are all of the people you have to be aware of for the story mm-hmm. to come. Um, but part one has all the exposition, and part one has all the character introductions, and part one kind of, it kind of can stand on its own narratively because until the very, very, very last moment when I have Napoleon come on and do a soliloquy about how he's going to invade Russia, Mm -hmm. um, everything up to that point is pretty contained. Like, there is a resolution. It's kind of an unsatisfying resolution, Mm -hmm. but there is a resolution at the end of part one. Uh, And we do end with with two of our three main characters having an intimate moment together. So it can it can kind of work on its own. I would say that if a, if a company wanted to do only part one, they would just have to like nix Napoleon's final speech. Like you would just have to end with Natasha and Pierre commuting after her attempted suicide and just let that be the end and let the sort of future of the characters be a mystery and not open up the can of worms that is Napoleon being like, I am going to take your country. <laughs> um, so, so that would probably be, if it was ever going to be published, I think I would make that note that any company wanting to do just part one w- would be totally within rights to just like take an ax to Napoleon's. So I mean, that's one less character because yeah, that's his perfect. first appearance. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, speaking of the length of it, because as you said, it cover such a long period of Russian history in here. In your introductory notes to the text, you say something that I think is interesting that I will read for the audience today. Directors are encouraged to find creative and or metatheatrical ways of guiding the audience through this chronology. So that's an interesting suggestion, and I like when playwrights allow the directors to have that freedom, and especially metatheatrically, but do you have any specific in minds of what that staging might look like, or at least if you were, say, directing it, how you would make it creative or metatheatrical in that way? Yeah. Um, so my, uh, my very uncreative idea is just to use um, uh, projections, mm-hmm. to, have a, to have a projection screen that we almost forget is there, except when all of a sudden everything will go dark and, like, 1806 will just flash for the audience, right? Like, just using it... Um, and even though that will uh, potentially take the the audience out of the um, the true movement and acceleration of the plot, because they'll be like, "Oh, oh, okay, now we're now we're skipping forward. This is a play." But like, um, I think that I think projections are like a sort of maybe the easy solution here. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it would be like truly funny if there was one of the I have a the way I've structured the cast is there are six characters. Um, that are just, it's just one character for an actor to play. So there are six tracks, uh, Natasha, the, it's the golden trio and the, sil- the silver trio. So you've got Natasha, Pierre, and Andre as the golden trio. You've got Maria, Nikolai, and Sonia as the silver trio. Those six roles are intended to be played by one actor only. Then there's an ensemble, then there's an ensemble of eight, uh, and all of those eight performers play multiple characters so if you're in the ensemble um you're just designated like a number basically and then you have all of the characters that you play on that numbered track um i think it would be delicious for a character for a for an actor from the ensemble who has a smaller lesser track like maybe track one which is um lisa andre's andre's Mm -hmm. first wife um and a couple other small female characters like for that actor to also be like a stage manager, kind of, or to have a to have some sort of like an uh, hour town stage manager, not like yeah, the actual so stage like, manager. Exactly, yeah. to have like authority over the production in a way that is metatheatrical. So maybe she 
maybe she plays Lisa, but mm -hmm. then we see her after Lisa dies, spoiler, we see her like take off whatever, like the outer part of the Lisa costume and be like, all right, forward two years. You know what I mean? Like have, have her or, you know, because she has so few lines comparatively, like have someone like that um, just, you know, uh, tell the audience, okay, now we're skipping. Okay, now, like, I'm, yes, I'm an actor. I'm in costume. I'm taking the costume off. I'm, I was never really Lisa. It's all a pretend. And now we got to go to 1806. You know, like that could also happen. Um, it's just in, in the, t I try to be very clear in the text that the characters say so that you don't have to be meta theatrical. If a director really wants that fourth wall and really wants to create a sense of realism, that is totally their prerogative. You can. It's not like I, I don't really break. Uh, yeah, there's only a couple moments I can think of in it where you directly. Moments, but yeah. yeah, but, but they're more, not they're not meta theatrical as much as they are just like hey important big point here. Yeah, so I don't want directors to feel like they have to be meta theatrical. That's why I said creative and or because um, if they want that that screen, that's totally within their rights. Um, and I think that so for instance, like when we come back from the intermission in part one, we have skipped forward four entire years. Um, that's why I took intermission where I did. I was like, this is where it has to happen so that the actress playing Natasha, for instance, whose hair has probably been down because she's been a little girl, can like put it up, you know, in the 20 minute intermission. So um, after intermission, we come back, it's four years. I have a line where Nikolai says, it was four years ago. <laughs> very intentional, very like, you know, admittedly not subtle, but it is a, it is a tool that I'm giving to directors in case they want to be realistic where they don't have to break that fourth wall to reveal that the time change has occurred. Um, but yes, it is, part one is a, it's just a nightmare because there's just so much, there's so much terrain that it covers and there's just, there's so much time that passes. Yeah, I think that's fair. Definitely on all that. Uh, so I guess I, I'm just going to get into some more things that I personally found really impressive about the play, and if you want to comment on them, you can. <laughs> um, but one that I really liked, and it feels like it's the kind of thing that usually doesn't draw much attention, but your stage directions are lovely. Like, like, and especially hearing that, like, the, the Golden Trio work was all really about, like, the dialogue and the lines and the character choices. I feel like this, like, window into the stage directions, which speaking of how we're going to have to stage this eventually, like a lot of that, or at least what you have in there might get lost in the staging, but reading it on the page, I think you've done some remarkable, like, I don't even know how to describe them. I kind of just, with your permission, I'd love you to do a dramatic reading of one of them that I've picked here, if you don't mind. I've put it in the Zoom chat if you want to read it, but this, for context, it's the, it's the Battle of Austerlitz, which you've change the timeline that it corresponds with Pierre's wedding happening at the same time. So if you'd like to add additional context, you can, or you could just go ahead and read it. So the only context I'll give is that, again, the scene, the, the two plays in total have about 100 scenes, and the Battle of Austerlitz is scene 10. So just to give you an idea of where we are in the timeline for the characters, we're not that far in. Yeah, we're not spoiling much here. We're not spoiling. <laughs> I thought about doing the Borodino one, but I'm like, no, that's too late. This one is also yeah, very good. Yeah, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Scene 10. Morning. December 2nd, 1805. The Battle of Austerlitz. Pierre's wedding day. Greek Orthodox chanting, men screaming, shit spraying, bodies tumbling, guns blazing, smoke clinging, flies buzzing, cannons roaring. Pierre has no idea what's going on. Nikolai has no idea what's going on. Helene smiles grimly. Napoleon Bonaparte smiles grimly. Pierre takes up Helene's hand. Andre takes up a Russian standard. He begins to march, shouting at the top of his lungs, waving the standard back and forth. One by one, his fellow soldiers fall in behind him, guns high, bleeding from wounds they no longer feel. Pierre leans in to kiss Helene. He hesitates. A grenade lands near Andre. He hesitates. Explosion. <laughs> Thank you. That's yep. great. That is wonderful. So for context, in my engagement with the play, that was where the 20 page sample that I had read ended. And I'm like, what a note to end on. And like just the pairing of the two, like one sentence about Austerlitz, one sentence about the wedding and really like hammering home this parallel. 
and something that we, we've talked about this before, but something you can do in theater that you can't really do in any other media is these things actually can happen simultaneously. Like I, I said this to you when I first read it, that it calls to my mind the scene in The Godfather where the baptism scene, where it's Michael sitting in the church, but he's being baptized and people getting killed. And it's, you have this like Kuleshov effect of, oh, it's Michael's baptism as the new Godfather. But yeah. that doesn't even happen simultaneously. It happens consecutively split up in this way that we're able to draw these connections. But I can just like picture this on stage, these two things happening side by side at the exact same time, each one of those, like the grins, the grenades, the hesitations, like everything. And then what even is the explosion at the end? Is it the grenade? Is it the whatever happens after the marriage? Who knows? <laughs> but like, I, I just think this is extraordinary. And while I can totally imagine seeing that staged and having those parallels come across, I think something's almost lost by not getting a chance to read it. If you see it, like, I really hope you get this play published soon because everybody should read this. It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. In addition to, sorry, I didn't mean to get y'all for clumped, but. <laughs> no, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm so honored by that. Thank you for saying that. No, I, um, and again, I, I didn't plan these, these stage directions. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't, all I cared about was depicting on stage, utilizing, as you say, the medium of theater, which is unique. Uh, in that you can be non-realistic and still have the story be conveyed in a realistic way. Um, I just wanted to conflate the spheres. I just wanted the political sphere, the war sphere, to directly intersect with the private sphere. And I wanted to utilize the medium of theater in which things can happen simultaneously, even if they're worlds apart, to the best of my ability. And so scenes like this, scenes like the inner, the, the inner cut between... Um, Katuzov's letter and Pierre's challenge to Dolokhov, scenes like Andre writing from the front and Lisa receiving the letter as she's about to go into labor, um, Annette and the Tsar reading letters over each other, the Rostov family reading a letter from Nikolai while he also processes his new feelings for Maria at the same time. Like, I just wanted, I wanted things colliding in my scenes. Um, and that's, it's using theater, um, it's, it's, conflict, it's conflating the spheres, but also, um, to me, it is a way of compressing time. It, it's a way of um, being allowing me as a playwright to speed through stuff that I just don't have time to give individual attention to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I think this, what you just read and many of the other ones in here do belong in like, if there was ever a stage direction hall of fame, like put that right on the wall next to Exit Pursued by Bear. Like <laughs> that's where it belongs. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm among you now. <laughs> it's great. Uh, well, then, to kind of, we're getting close to the end here, but one other thing I would be remiss if I did not mention is, big spoiler alert here, but the epilogue. So, yeah. for context, when you first sent me the script and we were, like, talking about it at first, I, like, half-jokingly said, I don't even want to know how you handle the philosophy of history chapters, like that big, long epilogue, and even the ones that, like, because for those who haven't read the book, while it is this like very gripping, engaging narrative of these characters, the small scale story of these like multiple love triangles and this large scale story of this war, it's also this complex philosophical meditation on the philosophy of history. And there are many chapters that some editions will take out in abridged versions, but many chapters are just Tolstoy just describing what's on his mind, why things turned out the way they did, what the historical debates of his time were. He has like a whole chapter of just explaining what guerrilla warfare was, because I guess it was a fairly new concept at the time. <laughs> and, and yeah, and then of course this big final epilogue where the big summation of why you've been reading this story all along it can't be because of the characters, but it's because of what this what the actual Napoleonic invasion of Russia of 1812 really meant and the way yeah. we can understand, you know, history being puppeted by some higher power for Tolstoy. That was obviously God, but like the fact right. that, yeah, but it was a really a refutation of like the Emersonian Carlyle theory of like great men of history and everyone viewed people like Napoleon and Tsar Alexander and Kutuzov as these great figures and it's because of them that things turned out the way they did but Tolstoy's yeah. like not so fast look at all these little people doing their thing yeah. so I was just expecting that obviously you would disregard that much like abridged versions of the novel just take all that away because you don't really need it to engage with the story which is the thing that most people come to it for I figure an adaptation of course isn't gonna mess with all of that because how do you make that dramatic how do you stage any of that 
And then I read your epilogue. Oh man, do you want to describe what you did with this? I'm gonna let you describe it. Ooh. Because I because I wrote it. I'm too I'm too intimately connected. I'd love to know for you as a reader what you read. Okay, so we have the final scene of the narrative proper, which is Pierre proposing to Natasha. Spoiler alert, that works out in the end. <laughs> um, which actually isn't even the end of the narrative in the book, because we get this like first epilogue of their happy married life, <laughs> which you, I think, were fine to cut. But then after that scene plays out, the deceased Andre walks onto the stage or appears on stage, I guess it's a directing decision, and he starts doing this monologue of, it's, I think it is taken from the epilogue of the book, this idea of this, the causality of history and the locomotive and movement, I won't describe the whole thing, and interspersed with that, you have the voices of the ensemble just naming different military conflicts in history, chronologically from the Napoleonic Wars all the way to most recently the Russian engagements in Crimea. Then only, ev wars, only wars that Russia directly fought. Yes, so an entire chronology interspersing this monologue on what the Napoleonic Wars meant to Tolstoy and the people of his contemporary time, intercut with these like spurts of like the Russo Japanese War, trying to the first Russian Revolution, et cetera, et cetera, just going on intercutting. So we see that history isn't just this moment that we're reflecting on now, it's us in 2020 reflecting on every single Russian military engagement that's happened since. While interspersed with Andre, this character, who I think was the perfect choice of the character to do this monologue, really like being the one to give voice to what this was all about, or at least seemed to be all about to Tolstoy. And also interspersed, we have various lines from individual characters that suddenly have new thematic resonances when put into, I'm trying to think of now specific examples of that. Maybe you want to like point out a few of them. But... Yeah, well, there's one, there's one moment um, where Tolstoy, and so in my version, Andre, <laughs> he talks about the, the, the force, the force that moves people. <laughs> and, in, and in Tolstoy's epilogue, what he means is uh, human desire, right? So if we need food, if we need food, we go get it, and that moves people. If we need shelter, we go get it, and that moves people. If, um, if, a, if a corrupt totalitarian government um, wants to, you know, create a Christian state, um, they drive out, you know, Jewish people, and that's a migration of people. It's, it's that government's desire for control. So, so the, the force that moves people, he means it as desire. <laughs> What I think is the force that moves people is love. And so right after I give, right, so right after Andre says that line, I have a couple of wars and I can't remember which ones. And then Maria says, I am so in love with you, I don't know what to do. Um, which is a line that she says to Nikolai in the scene where, where they get together. Um, because for me, it's a, it's a, it's a moment um, of, of obviously like great, great love. And that is a, that is a great force. But also, um, you know, it, it doesn't, when, when we say a force moves people, it doesn't necessarily have to move them in terms of a location, or it doesn't have to move them towards a goal. It just, it just has to move them. It just has to change them somehow. And so when Maria says that, like, this, this girl who has been so sheltered and abused and dismissed her entire life, for her to just burst out saying, but I, I, I love you and that's it. I, like, I, I don't know what to do. I just love you. Um, it's such a, it's, it's such a triumph for her as a character, even though she feels vulnerable and scared, as she says, even though it doesn't feel triumphant or powerful for her, it is, it is powerful for the audience. At least I hope it is. Um, it, it it's is a for moment. the reader, I will say. Okay. <laughs> I, I imagine it will be even more so for the audience. Yeah. But, yeah. So, um, so as Andre is describing, you know, the force that moves people, I'm, I'm basically using Maria and Maria's journey to to replace Tolstoy's exploration of desire with a much more intimate, uh, with the, I'm, I'm replacing it with the more intimate variable of love. Yeah. 
perfect, I think. What a note to end on, like, for is just this. And that's the thing, that's why I think it would almost be a shame to do just part one in isolation, because so many of my favorite things happen in, like, this huge culmination. I would almost, I feel like this wouldn't make sense at all, but I would almost love if you were to just do part one to still then take the epilogue and replace the Napoleon line with that, but I don't think that would make sense if you haven't seen <laughs> everything else. Like, Andre's still alive by that point, so it doesn't make sense for him to be doing this monologue. <laughs> There would be, and there would be a lot of lines that the audience wouldn't have heard. There are a lot of lines from the characters that yeah. they speak part two. The audience would be like, I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I guess you just have to do both parts together. Or <laughs> that's the, so. that's <laughs> the only <laughs> explanation or how we can get away with this. Uh, oh, so yeah, that's great. I just, I thought that was extraordinary. And like, I was shocked reading it because like my thought was just not only did you handle the philosophy of history portions of this, but you found a dramatically engaging way of doing it that releases this narrative from the amber of its like early 19th century Russian context and brings it all the way to today while still finding like these more grounded character beats that actually like tie it all together as opposed to just being a long philosophy essay that's tacked at the end of this novel like it kind of is when you read it in the book like yeah I just thought it was extraordinary and thank you for writing it and allowing me to read it. <laughs> Uh, so we've kind of covered most of the questions I had, even if we hadn't like gotten to them in the chronology, but I'm glad like we're jumping around so great. This is awesome. Uh, then like there are a few things on the screen earth that I enjoy talking about more than like this book or Tolstoy's work. So it's so fun nerding out with you about it. Uh, I guess just one kind of final question before we wrap up is what other literary adaptations might you have for us in the works or if not in the works at the moment, other ones you might want to tackle on the horizon? Oh, man. And you knew I was so excited that you were asking this. Um, yeah, I am I am one act into a three-act stage adaptation of Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, um, which is, if this, if my War and Peace adaptation was radical, I don't even want to think of what label they're going to slap onto my Tale of Two Cities adaptation because it is wildly different. I have a very, I have a, a framing device. I, I employ metatheatricality. I, I decenter the protagonist. Um, uh, I frame the whole story through the female perspective, um, and, uh, and I just invent, I have just invented a lot of stuff. Um, so it's very different from the book. Um, which I have not read, I will say. So if you want to send it to me after, I will be going in blind, like most of your actors or collaborators did with yeah. one piece. Um, but, uh, it's, it's a story about, about, um, class oppression, right? Oppression mm -hmm. of the, of the underprivileged. Um, it's a story about um, oppressive laws and and the the, the inherent unfairness uh, and systemic injustice of the legal system, um, the insufficiency of of laws and of police um, to to really protect the people who need protection. Um, Very topical right now. Yeah, it's a story about xenophobia mm -hmm. uh, and how we other people and how we treat the other. Um, and, and it, it's a story, um, and, and yet it is a story of profound love and family and, and endurance um, and, and sacrifice. It is, it is perhaps one of the greatest stories of sacrifice in, in Western literature. Um, and so it, is, it has been a, an absolute joy to work on in these, in these past few weeks. Um, uh, yeah, I'm finding, I'm finding so much contemporary resonance and so much sort of personal resonance. Um, and it's very different from War and Peace. It is a different beast altogether. Mm -hmm. um, it's a 350 page book as opposed to a 1200 page book. And yet, to, in, and yet it's a 350 page book in which there are almost no scenes. So I have to invent everything that everyone mm -hmm. says, um, which is great. There's a lot of freedom in that, but it is also a book in which the, the only central female character is a flimsy, fainting, two dimensional, like blonde Barbie who, who does nothing and just cries a lot. So I had my work cut out for me as a, yeah, as a founder. Um, but I have been, I've been thoroughly enjoying working on it. And then the other one that I'm like, someday, some, someday I'll do this, uh, is I want to adapt The Great Gatsby. Hmm. Yes. I think that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whenever you finish these, send them my way, because of course I would love to read them. I will. <laughs> and you. hopefully eventually one day, who knows, see them staged. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, nothing would make me happier. You, 
free ticket to any performance <laughs> ever. I'll still have to make my way to North Carolina or wherever you're staging it, but yes, free ticket. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs> and you've been such a good friend to Cup of Hemlock. We should probably do the same for you when we have our productions of whatever we wind oh, up gosh. doing. <laughs> such an honor. I'm like thrilled and delighted that I get to be part of your ecosystem now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, likewise. That's great. Well, that's probably over about the time we have, but this was a wonderful conversation and this is just going on YouTube. So it could be as long as we want. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but this was a wonderful conversation. Thank you for joining me. I remember your answer to this when we did King John, but do you want to share some social media handles if anyone oh, <laughs> wants to yeah. find you? <laughs> God, I'm, I'm so, so bad at this whole world. Yeah, um, so I think I'm the 357th Claire Martin on Facebook, so you can find me there. But do you um, want friendly requests from strangers on Facebook? Oh yeah, send me a message. Just send, let, let me know who you are, and mm -hmm. we'll, we're friends. Sure. Um, I I am on Instagram at Claire F Martin. Oh, um, is that new? I don't recall that being part I, of the King John I mean, answer. Kind of. I think I forgot about it when we did the <laughs> King John episode. I don't post much, mm -hmm. uh, but I will, if you follow me, I will absolutely follow you back and I will like all of your beautiful pictures. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't have a Twitter. That's fine. Um, <laughs> but mostly, I remember, yeah, go ahead. I would say, I would say go onto Facebook and go to Sweet Tea Shakespeare or the Sweet Tea Shakespeare community. Those are both pages where we share all of the work that's being done for our podcasts, radio dramas, full reads. Like you'll see a lot of my work uh, just on, on the Sweet Tea pages. Great. So that's, that's what I would really recommend. Okay. Um, and we could put all of Sweet Tea's socials down in the description of this video. Okay. And I remember for King John, you also included your email. If anyone wanted to talk to you, I don't know if you want to do that yes. again. Or, yeah. I'm glad you said that I would have, because I absolutely would have <laughs> forgotten. Yeah. So if you would like to, to chat with me more, um, uh, my email is clairefmartin6 at gmail.com. So that's C-L-A-I-R-E, F as in fairy tale, Martin, M-A-R-T-I-N, six at gmail.com. Fantastic. Maybe someone who wants to produce two very wonderful plays based on War and Peace might reach out to you. You heard it here first. It's very yeah. good. <laughs> this is fantastic. All right. Well, I think that is about covers it. Once again, Claire, thank you for joining me and having this amazing conversation about all my favorite things. So this was, I will admit, this was a selfish one for me to get you on the show, but I really appreciate <laughs> you being here. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. I feel like the selfish one. I've just been blathering, <laughs> but this has been just an abject joy for me. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I, I'm sure many, many writers uh, can, can attest to this. Um, it, is, it is more than flattering. It is moving when you, when you find someone who has deeply engaged with your work um, and, and really mined it for meaning and really thought deeply about it. it is, there is nothing more, um, more special. So I am, I'm just deeply grateful to you, Ryan, for, um, for continuing to uh, advocate for my work, for allowing me to, you know, sort of share it in this very visible way, and just for, for really considering it as, as deeply and as dramaturgically as you have. It means a lot of to course. me. Of course. I wouldn't do have it any other way. <laughs> well, we're looking forward to having you back on our Othello episode, which should go up in a few weeks from now when this video goes live. And we, we have a very exciting panel for that one, in addition to Claire, that I might not be allowed to announce yet, but it's going to be a wonderful array of guests. And uh, yeah, you're also, we look forward to the As You Like It and whatever else we have coming up in the pipeline. So you, you'll be back, I'm sure, in all of our little ecosystem of whatever we have going on. And I look forward to a lot more fruitful engagement between our two companies and ourselves as artists. Oh, as so, do I. So. Yeah. Cheers to that. Well, that's been another episode of The Cup. Thank you all for tuning in. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or however YouTube videos go viral. Let's let's make this one a viral one, why don't we? We're due for one. Um, also, our polished reading of Ghosts has been up for a few weeks now, so if you haven't had a chance to watch that, we have an amazing cast. Will Bartley, our artistic director, really uh, did a lot of really hard work on it, and I dramaturged the script on that one, if you care. <laughs> um, so check that out. Check out our other Cup episodes. Our Shakespeare series is coming to an end, and we're working on figuring out what we're going to do after that. So stay tuned for all of that. Once again, thank you, Claire, for joining me. And I think that calls it a day. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.